Good afternoon and welcome to this new installment of uh, Machiavelli Talks, the, the, the English language series by the Machiavelli Center for Political and Strategic Studies. Today's guest is uh, Mr. Thibault Muserg, expert in political parties and international politics, uh, currently working as uh, Europe uh, Program Director for the International Republican Institute. Uh, Thibault, good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Good afternoon and thanks for inviting me. We are all quite familiar now with the notion of uh, uh, a shift by the working class towards the, the right side of political spectrum, generally in all the, all, all the Western politics. But in your, in your book, uh, The Great Class Shift, you go a bit further. You identify uh, four new classes currently redefining Western politics. Yes, so basically what, 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 I, what I try to say in the book is that we should not only focus on uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, shift from the, for, for, for the, 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 the uh, working class shift from left to, to right, uh, which obviously has been very documented and I think has, 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 has been really at the forefront of uh, of the, the, the Western political realignments over the past few uh, over the past few months and years, and people talked about it during the Trump campaign uh, in 2016, in during the uh, uh, during the the, 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 the Brexit uh, debate. But that's that's been in the making for for quite some time. I mean, you know, the the Front National in France had become the the first working class party long before uh, Donald Trump. So th these are trends that you see all around the West, and uh, uh, and they are spectacular. But it's only part of the puzzle. Uh, the, the 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 if you look at the puzzle in full, you have you've had a, a realignments that have happened uh, based on what I call class, or you can call that socioeconomic categories if you don't like the term uh, uh, the, the term class, but but but. Uh, you know, there, there, there have been multiple realignments, uh, some to the right, others to the left, but most, mostly leading Western societies more, uh, uh, more to the right on, on, on a number of issues, a little bit to the left on, on, on a few other issues, but mostly, uh, uh, mostly to the right. So the, the classes that I identify in my book are the, work, the working class, or what I call the new minority, uh, the uh, uh, provincial middle class, the, the the millennials, so educated young folks who are, you know, at the spearhead of the of the woke movement, they are, are trying to change that are trying to change the left right now. And I would say importantly, because that everything start, stems and starts from them, the uh, the creative class, which emerged in the uh, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, and you, you have to think here about. People who have uh, who have made tremendous amounts of money over the past 20, 30 years uh, over the creative business. So we're thinking about uh, computer software developers. Uh, we're thinking about Hollywood. We're thinking about uh, you know people in in all professions that require uh, uh, creative uh, thinking, and and they have been. Uh, they have been rising over the past 20 years and starting around uh, the, the 2010s, they started taking such an importance in politics that, you know, they basically started to uh, dictate, the, uh, dictate the agenda. I mean, uh, it was Barack Obama's election. You had uh, David Cameron in the UK it was a sort of alliance between the, the middle class and the, uh, and the creative class in which the creative class really had the lead. And, and, and you saw that agenda uh, being developed by the creative class, to which there have been multiple reactions. Uh, reactions of um, uh, strong negation by first by the uh, by the, the 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 middle class over not over the economic agenda but over the uh, uh, the cultural agenda. Uh, everything that was you know flexibility, working hours, um, uh, diversity, uh, to which there was a strong pushback. Uh, but that was not enough, and it really when the Working class really came to be uh, championed by people like Donald Trump, uh, or you know, people like Marine Le Pen, or uh, to a different extent uh, by people like Boris Johnson. That the 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 the, the political landscape shifted because all of a sudden 
the right, which was seeming seemed to be until you know in the early 2010s, which seemed the, the right seemed to be very much on the defense, and all of a sudden they they they, they because of this addition of the of the working class started to be on the offense and that has also led in the in the meantime the frustration of the millennials who have lost out of the uh, in the uh, in the rise of the creative class because the creative class came first uh, they took all the, the the good jobs and basically they told the uh, the millennials you're gonna ha you're gonna have those good jobs too in a, uh, in a couple of years and the couple of years came and they didn't get those those jobs so you're talking about you know young folks that are economically frustrated that are that find a bill in the ideas maybe not of, of of socialism of not communism per se but of socialism or socializing things also through the rise of uh, uh, of social media etc uh, who also are part of who are basically trying to engineer a backlash the cultural backlash against the creative class so uh we we're talking here about four classes that are interacting with each other I, it, it's you know at times it's really culture warfare it's culture wars but it, it's a culture war in which there are four camps so it's uh it's very much like you know italian diplomacy the city states during the the late middle middle ages with uh, the enemy of, of my enemy becoming my friend and every once in a while you see weird combinations such as you know moments when Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France asks uh, uh, Le Pen voters to go to him so basically to go from far right to far left uh, and, and, and you have you know the other way uh, other way around people from Bernie Sanders who are tempted who were tempted and who did vote uh, for Donald Trump in the US election in 2016 and in 2020 so um, you know the the that makes politics in the West much more fluid and uh, much more I would say much more confusing for a lot of observers so the goal of my of my book was to try and make sense out of it trying to drop you know, basically what I've just done, which is to say, you know, far left, far right, to drop all these old um, uh, uh, sort of trademarks that were given to politicians, drop them for a while, although they, they do they do still have a meaning, but drop them for a while and try to, to look at things from a, uh, from a different perspective. Yes, in fact, in your book, uh, you offer a criticism to a supply-side vision of politics, suggesting instead uh, that uh, demand side, uh, um, a vision of political parties as uh, vehicles for class interest uh, is more compelling. Could you explain why? Yeah, so, I mean, for the past the past 10 years or even, even more the past 20 years, a lot of attention has been put on uh, what I call uh, supply side politics. So it was up to the politicians to try and define a vision for uh, winning the center, so to speak, and bringing the center with them to a vision for the future of the country. You think Tony Blair's third way, that's an excellent example. And even, you know, later on, David Cameron really followed uh, uh, that logic by, you know, of, let's try to get the center to move towards the center, get that center in, you know, a sort of social liberal uh, uh, idea, which can be, you know, there, there are differences. You know, David Cameron and, and Tony Blair are not the same people, and it's not the same party. But mainly, it was, you know, it was it was really focused on this, like, and, and trying to move towards the center, and to, trying to find the center and stick to it. And what we found out over the past ten years, really, since 2010, after the, the crisis of 2008, which really was a, a, a game changer. What what we've seen is that there, there have been you know the, the 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 politics have been moving much more to uh, our demand side, and and because you've had these huge shifts in politics with winners and losers uh, after, and big winners and big losers after the, after the the 2008 financial crisis, uh, you know things have started to polarize, and we've gone back to the idea that well, politics first of all, politics matter again. It's not just you know political marketing, and you know you need to have an idea, you need to have an ideology, and you need to 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 rest your your political program on on certain categories of the of the population. But even more, you know, the idea that political parties and and and, and politics in general are defined not by a bunch of spin doctors who sit in London, Rome, or Washington, and you know manipulate so to speak symbols and uh and, and 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 work with public opinion but it's actually coming from you know from, from from the bottom up and 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 that political parties are something that we forgot was that political parties are the expression of 
uh, uh, demands from certain categories of the population. Very often you hear, including you know, politicians, right? Political party leaders saying, ah, oh, we represent the majority, we represent the uh, you know the future of the country, or we represent a vision uh, for the country. That's that's actually not very true. That's actually not true at all. What, what politicians in political parties represent is when they are leaders of their political parties, uh, what they represent is the aspirations of certain categories of the population. And I, I, I don't hesitate to, to call the, these classes because I come from, a, although I'm, I'm a Frenchman, I come from a British uh, uh, politics uh, uh, background. And, and, and in Britain, class is a fundamental part of politics. And you don't need to be a Marxist to understand politics as class. Actually, I'd like to quote a, uh, a, 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 a a politologist called Richard, uh, I think it's Richard, Peter Pulser, uh, who was writing in the 1960s, and he was saying that uh, class is the basis of British politics. Uh, all the rest is embellishment and detail. And, and, and Pulser can be accused of a number of things, but definitely not of being a socialist. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, the, 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 I use the, 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 the term class, you can use socioeconomic class, uh, socioeconomic uh, category or, 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 or something else. But, but, but really, I think we forgot this, you know, truism, which is that, you know, at the end of the day, political parties are there essentially to represent in the political arena the, um, the interests of segments of the population, of classes. And after that, you know, these political parties come together in coalition or they come together as a big umbrella coalition, like the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, the Democrats in the, in the United States, in order to, you know, articulate from those, you know, from those, from those aspirations of section of society, a larger uh, 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 view of the general interest, but that is stemming all the time from uh, these different sections of society. So that's what I mean by uh, uh, by by you know uh, demand side politics. Well, in your book, uh, you 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 have described uh, how that uh, first class system works differently in various Western countries. What are the main differences you have found? So. Uh, again, I think we need to start by the, you know, the, 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 if, if we are to look at these, you know, four classes, we need we need to look at the uh, at them individually and what 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 they represent, what they what they stand for, where they come from as well. Um, you need to start with the creative class because once again, as I said earlier, this is where their rise is the start of everything else. Uh, the creative class, as I said, you know, professionals, uh, educated, uh, that's important, uh, usually affluent living in big metropolises. So you, you already have the image of the, uh, you know, of, of the Bobo in Paris or the, you know, uh, uh, the liberal in, uh, uh, in New York uh, who lives in, you know, uh, in good conditions, but he, ha he leads a life that is very different from, from that of others. Usually when you thought about creative people in the past, whether it was painters like uh, uh, Van Gogh or, uh, uh, or, you know, or people in the entertainment industry, there were people who were bohemians, right? There, there were La Bohème. It was uh, 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 more a, people who were poor, who had, you know, could have a lot of money, but there were, many, there were very few people who had a lot of money. Uh, and, and, and most of them lived either in poverty or, or with uh, regular financial, uh, financial difficulties. Because of the rise of the internet and the creative economy, think of you know Microsoft, Facebook, uh, uh, Google, Amazon, etc. Because of the rise of the creative economy, these people have gone very quickly, tremendously rich, and as a result, they have become powerful. That's what happens when you become rich. That's the, the story of the bourgeoisie in the in the 19th century, and um, as a result of that, they suddenly understood that they were starting to uh, uh, to to hold uh, uh, cultural power. And by holding cultural power, then the next stage is political power, because as you start getting gaining a dominant position in society, what you're trying to do is to, you know, not, not even consciously, but what, what you're trying to do is to sort of impose your views on the rest of society. So to give you an example, you know, the creative class doesn't know the difference between work time and uh, leisure time. Both of them are intertwined. So for them, it makes complete sense 
to have you know open Sundays in which businesses are open all the time. Uh, it makes sense to have flexible hours, and you're seeing the creative class right now is at the forefront. The Economist in uh, in the UK and in the US is at the forefront to ask for more flexible working hours, more flexible, uh, uh, more flexible working days. Um, that also uh, translates in demands for greater diversity. For the creative class, you know, creativity requires diversity. Uh, you probably heard about the, 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 the Medici effect, you know, when everybody coming from different walks of life, different, uh, uh, different styles of architecture, of art, come together in one, uh, one city, Florence, in the case of, the, of, 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 you know, the Medici effect, the Medici, uh, Medici Florence, where it can be, you know, New York uh, in, the, in the 2000s. You know, when you have very different people who come and, and exchange uh, over the course of time, then basically that, place becomes a hub for creative thinking and you have new ideas that come in that come out and everybody becomes rich that that's the model of the silicon that of the silicon valley think uh the uh think how google is operating the thing is that you know uh this uh demand for diversity also means that the creative class is actually totally okay and even demanding for ethnic diversity they want uh, uh, they, they're, they're okay with immigration. They actually want more immigration because that means that it means more diversity. More diversity brings more idea. It means, in their mind, more riches for the general commonwealth. What they do not see is that there are there's a price to pay for that diversity, and very often it's not them who are paying that price because they live in segregated areas in which they don't have those minorities, those poor minorities living with them, and that's that brings a whole you know, a whole bunch of different issues that others have to deal with. And those others who have to deal with are, uh, uh, with all this stuff, they are the ones who are, uh, uh, you know, who are part of the backlash, the cultural backlash against the, the creative class. And that that backlash, you have two different backlashes. There's the one from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the what I call the provincial or, or, or suburban middle class. And by the way, when I talk about provincial middle class, and I, I, this is not a, a, a bad thing for me. I myself, I'm coming from France's provinces, so I, I don't see this as a, as, a, as a negative. But, you know, when you think about the, um, uh, the, the provincial middle class, uh, this is the environment in which I grew up, in which, you know, everybody has their cars and they need their cars in order to get, you know, to the supermarket, to do anything. They need their cars and they live in a in a semi-detached or, or fully detached house a, a bit further out from the city centers. And their their outlook about life is completely different from the uh, from the creative class. They're still in many countries, they're still the majority, uh, although one that is shrinking, uh, but they're still a majority. And they're seeing their way of life, which was which used to be dominant, uh, being very much uh, um, uh, challenged uh, first by the creative class, but also by other classes. And and they are, uh, you know, they're trying to that they're, they're trying to keep their way of life. They're trying to they want to keep their uh, they want to keep their cars. They want to be able to still drive around uh, whenever they want. Uh, for them, it's it's something that is important. They don't want all that diversity nonsense because their success their personal success and their family success has been made on you know building and referring to a mound uh, uh you know it's it's the uh, industry not artisan industry but it, it's it's mass uh, uh mass industry and that they, they've been working and, and and being and they've been successful in that trade and they they think that it's that it's the way that is the way forward so they don't want to disappear they don't want to um be dictated their way of life by a bunch of people living in the city centers, and, um, and and they are rebelling against it. Now they're rebelling against it on cultural matters, but definitely not on um, uh, on, on on economic matters because economically they are also liberal, just like the the, the, the creative class is liberal. Uh, the ones who are uh, contesting both on the on, on the uh, uh, economic and the cultural uh, side are uh, the 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 working class. So that's that's the the new electorate uh, of you know that 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 was brought by Donald Trump. The new electorate that uh, uh, Boris Johnson managed to flip from the Labour Party to the Conservative Party, uh, and 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 some of that you know the electorate that 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 uh, in Italy uh, uh, Matteo Salvini has been able to to bring to Lega and and these people are they're, they're not economically they're not liberal I mean they're working class so for them uh, you know the uh, liberty uh, uh, is 
uh, is something that is that is actually putting them down. And the law, uh, trade laws, trade union, the trade union uh, is something that actually liberates them. That that's the way that they that they still see the world. And uh, uh, they they have been the real losers of the past uh, 10, 15, 20 years. If you look in America, uh, their uh, their standard of living has actually uh, declined over the past 20 years. And so they're you know they're the they are the ones who are really rebelling against the system, who want to change the system, and they have found different voices uh, in the, uh, you know, in the in the political system, and and those voices are actually very different, uh, including in their policies. I mean, you know, it, it, it's Marine Le Pen in France, it's been Donald Trump in the uh, in, in in the United States, it's also the Social Democrats in uh, in Romania or the uh, the Socialists in Bulgaria, because those have still kept a, a, a sort of link with. Uh, 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 with their, their old electorate and and on certain issues such as immigration, they've uh, uh, they've understood that there are concerns and they they, they have stuck to their uh, uh, to their uh, to their electorate. So uh, you know the answer in Western Europe, the answer is mainly that you know this this electorate has moved to the right, but it's, it it doesn't happen all the time, right? And so and the last um, the last category, the last class that I talk about in the group is the the millennials. Actually, I should talk about millennials and zillennials, and it's the you know young, educated but not affluent people that are just coming out of college with, you know, full of. Uh, 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 beautiful ideas about socialism that they usually haven't lived through, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, uh, they come in. They want to change the world, and uh, the 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 sort of polarization on the right that has happened with the working class, and you know what we've seen in the 2016, etc. In 2016, and 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 around that time that the the the, the, uh, the migrant crisis of 2015, all that has contributed to polarize them further to the left. So we're talking about another angry, uh, another bunch of angry people and frustrated people, uh, but they, they have moved much, much, much to the left. Um, and, and that has, I mean, this uh, radicality has expressed itself in different ways, right? It was Bernie Sanders in, uh, 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 in, in the US, uh, it's been Podemos in, uh, uh, in, in Spain, uh, Cinque Stelle in Italy, uh, but it's also Greta Thunberg in uh, uh, in uh, in Sweden, and and you know you, you're seeing different expression of the of, of the same phenomenon uh, uh, across across the West. So, you know, in a nutshell, uh, and I know that you know I, I'm speaking too much, so I, I'll leave you the floor back, uh, Daniele. Uh, but in a nutshell, this mm -hmm. is what what these uh, what these four classes are all about. Well, I would note also that uh, that the creative class. Uh, surely demand more diversity, more ethnic diversity, more cultural diversity, but not not really meant for um, diversity of political views, on the contrary. Um, focusing on Italy, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, with, with Salvini, but that was also a trend that uh, we can see in the past uh, already with Berlusconi's Forza Italia, uh, Salvini and prior of him, uh, Berlusconi uh, attracted a lot, the majority of the worker votes towards uh, the right. Um, so how the four class system is uh, redefining also the Italian political stage and in particular, what do you think the right wing parties should do to better adapt to it? So, I mean, talking about Italy is a bit difficult because you guys are always, you know, at least one, you know, one movement in advance of everybody else, which is also why why I'm in Italy to try and study how you guys are are doing. So it, it it's difficult for me to analyze because you know you, you guys are always ahead. So uh, uh, you know I have to uh, to to make a special effort uh, here. Uh, what I would say is that so you know there, there there is this movement with the you know with the working class, but the problem is that the problem is twofold. The first one is that the the working class is shrinking. Uh, it's 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 a, a a class in which you know there are less and less members uh, uh, every year, uh, and and that's a problem because if you want to get a majority, uh, uh, th this is really a problem. Uh, in America, Donald Trump has managed to expand the working class, his working class electorate, because he's done something that the left really didn't see coming, which was to uh, to start from a, the base of a of a white working class and expand it. Uh, towards 
uh, uh, some minorities, uh, which means that you know you have uh, a whole bunch of new people, uh, particularly in places like Florida on, or, or Texas, uh, that were of uh, uh, Hispanic descent uh, or that were Hispanics who started to vote Republican and voted for Donald Trump because you know because he's a PLN large from the white working class to you know the the the, the working class at large. I, I don't know if in Europe this is something that 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 can work and. Uh, um, we also have to understand that you know the whole issue of immigration worked very well between 2015 and 2019 uh, because that was that was clearly an issue. But but now it is still an issue that people care about. But it's 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 less the number one priority because we haven't had something as crazy as the 2015 uh, 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 migration crisis. So, it, you know, focusing only on migration limits the, limits the appeal uh, of, of, of the party. And there needs to be a, a larger, you know, a larger idea about where society is going that goes beyond, uh, beyond the question of immigration. And I think, you know, if you look at the Italian right, the Italian, the centro destra, is 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 actually quite ahead in this, and they you know they, they, there's really been some reflection and disagreements. I mean, the right is I mean, if you look at the right where, wherever it's in in Italy, in 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 Spain, in 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 France, it's it's a debate, right? It's a very large debate. You have very different schools of thought, and and and, and in, you know uh, many different electorates as, as well. So it's it's very difficult to to aggregate them. Um, in in many ways, what I think. You, there, there is also something that, that that has also changed since 2015, 2017 in Italy, which is that you know you have the European Recovery Fund, which changes a lot of a lot of things uh, in Italy when it comes to uh, you know the availability of funding and uh, and the, the availability of funds to to develop the country, and uh, uh, you know th this makes a lot of policy options uh, uh, look completely different. So. Um, from the perspective of, of you know how to work out you know how to navigate between the classes, uh, if if the right is to be successful in Italy, the right cannot limit itself to the to the working class. Maybe you know a a, a, a larger working class. It has to include uh, at, at least a big part, big chunks of the uh, of the of the middle class. And the problem is that when you do that, then that means that you need to go more to the center. When you took from the the, the perspective of, of the supply side politics, and that makes you potentially lose votes within the working class because the working class they want stuff that is you know they they want more more hard stuff because they they have been hit harder they have been hit sorry harder by the crisis and they want they want more uh, uh, they, they want more decisive action. Uh, while you know, if you take things from the perspective of the middle class, while they want, they certainly want you know uh, the politicians to hit hard on immigration, for example, but they don't necessarily want radical rethinking in terms of the economics because economics have been going relatively well for them. So you know, navigating, you know, building a coalition and keeping that coalition uh, is something that is very important for the for the centro destra in Italy. I don't know if they will manage. Uh, right now they seem if if I you know make the addition of the of, of all the votes for the centro destra it's clear that they're in, in majority in Italy. But how this works out in the context of the recovery fund, how this works out in you know in, in a post covid environment in which people are probably Going may want to have a bit less confrontation right now and a little bit more money in their pockets. Uh, this is going to be it is going to be interesting to see. Uh, some sections of society might actually want more confrontation because they're the ones who have been paying the price for for the past uh, uh, for the crisis in the in, in, in the past few years. But but in general, at least in the short term, people might want actually to have a less confrontational approach. And, and you're seeing that, you know, all across Europe at the moment, for the past three, four months, the, the, the populist right has been, you know, really hitting a, a, a glass ceiling and even, uh, uh, you know, going down in, uh, uh, in, in, in the elections that we've seen coming up uh, uh, so far. I mean, you know, mentioning uh, uh, several, several elections, Bulgaria, uh, the, you know, the, the parties uh, further to the right have not made it to parliament for the first time in many years. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the ID, uh, uh, any CR parties have been going down. In France, the national rally, which was supposed to take a couple of 
regions in the in the elections in the regional elections um, uh, this uh, this sun, this past Sunday and the, the Sunday before actually ended up not winning any and getting uh, uh, very disappointing results in uh, uh, overall in in France. So uh, you know I I think. Uh, I, th I think politicians need to take that into account. You know, they, it's not, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the classes, but it's also their aspirations. And right now their aspirations are probably towards more, uh, more cooperative game. And in, in that sense, you know, it's, it's, it, it might be a good sign uh, for, uh, uh, for, 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 for Matteo Salvini, who chose to, uh, to support the government, uh, the new Draghi government in January. So we'll have to see how that how that plays out in the next few uh, few months. I'm afraid I, I can't give the magic formula for for winning because uh, if I if I if I had that, you can imagine that I would be a rich man by now. Well, you you are perfectly justified because it's very difficult to tell what 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 expect us and uh, surely uh, we have signed th those signs uh, from other European countries you describe, but we should say that for now, at least for now, Italy is apparently differing because if you think of these exploit of the brother of the, of Italy uh, party in, in in the poll the brother brother of Italy is on the right of uh, Salvini's Lega and uh, also the difficulties that uh, Lega is experiencing to keep its its base its uh, uh, popularity while uh, trying to to include the more centrist and moderate uh, vote uh, and and so moving partly towards the, the center but, but if, if, if I there may, is if another I may, you so, sorry then if, if, if i may just add something on this the, i think one one real challenge for lega one real challenge and i i think it's going to be one that is going to be very difficult to sort to, to sort out is that it has two bases there's the historic base which is in northern italy and and which is you know middle class uh, that the middle class of northern uh, of northern Italy that has been voting for Lega when it was Lega Nord and when it was Umberto Bossi and uh, uh, you know and, and and this is uh, this is really the provincial middle class and the Terza Italia as well and and you have this new electorate that was brought by Matteo Salvini which is a working class electorate which has you know very in many ways very different. Uh, uh, interests and articulating them already it's it's really remarkable how Matteo Salvini has managed to to keep and, and and Lega in general has managed to keep these two electorates together over the past uh, uh, the past few years and I would say also the past few months because it's uh, it, it, it's difficult right when you have one one part of the of your electorate uh, that 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 wants you know European recovery funds that wants you know uh, a, a more centrist approach and another part that is genuinely unhappy because they have been forced to be closed down you know i think of restaurant owners etc uh, that have been forced to be forced down for the past six months and they i mean there are people are literally dying you know economically dying so i mean it, it it's a real uh you know equilibrium that the 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 uh, uh the, the, the legal leadership has to has to make so far it has made it relatively well but the question is how it works out in the long term right there, there's still a year and a half until the next elections and we're going to have to see how it works out about fratelli d'italia the question about fratelli is you know are they you know right now they're the shiny new object why right a bit like lega under salvini five years ago how is it going to be in a year a year and a half you know you you only stay young uh, for 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 a, a certain period of time, after which you're no longer new and young, and and, and you need to uh, um, you need to differentiate yourself on your project much more, you know, much more forcibly. And 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 we'll see in a year and a half how how things are going to look like. Well, a great advantage for Fratelli Italia is that we will not have probably likely we will not have uh, general elections uh, in the next. Uh, uh, one year and a half, so maybe, maybe that party could manage to to remain young at still uh, at at um, at least until the next general election. But there, maybe there is another fast. huge problem. <laughs> Perhaps we will see. There, there is another huge problem that maybe you can help us to partly to solve because you are. Uh, you are a two decades profes professional uh, in in politics and uh, among other things, 
you have been a fundraiser also in France for center-right parties, candidates, uh, and uh, uh, organization of the civil societies. I don't know what is the situation in France, but surely in Italy um, there is a huge advantage by uh, for the left-wing NGOs, foundations, and fin tanks in fundraising compared to right-wing uh, uh, ones. Uh, could you suggest any best practice or, or, or strategy to fill that gap? Uh, well, I mean, it, 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 that, 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 would take, uh, that would take not an hour, but that would take a, a, a full day. Um, I think there is one, one thing, though, that we need to, uh, uh, to clarify, which is, the, you know, when we talk about the advantage, the financial advantage of, 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 of the left, I think it, it's more of an organizational advantage. Um, they, they have been around, you know, collecting money and getting subsidies, including from taxpayers' money. Uh, for for a very very long time, and they've been very good at it, uh, right? I mean, uh, I don't want to go back to uh, you know the usual you know talks about Gramsci and the, you know the the ideas about cultural hegemony and all that. But but I mean, this is part of a strategy that has been for a long time uh, uh, in 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 the making in the left. I think uh, uh, the, the the right is waking up is waking up to it in in Europe and in Italy um, much. Uh, with the with the idea, you know, with the idea, you know, we, now now we are in a minority, and or, or now we are under siege, and it, it's remarkable to see when you talk to left wing people, as I, as I do every once in a while, uh, that they, on the other hand, right now are saying, oh, we are besieged by you know the right, which is conquering new markets, and they're now they're come on TV, they have their own Fox News, so so you know, I think that we, we also need to be to to. To, to be aware that each of us have their we have our own fortresses so for example the left has its fortress in the uh, uh, in the universities and we on the right have our fortress in the uh, for example in the in the business in the traditional business sector what is changing things and this is where I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with you that the left now has an advantage over the over the right is that um, in terms of the elites uh, and in terms of uh, uh, in terms of, of, of money available, it is true that the rise of the creative class has meant that now there is a new, an, another left that is, you know, uh, culturally, uh, uh, definitely culturally on the left uh, that 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 has emerged with a lot of money, and that is making uh, uh, that it is making our position look look much more. Are more shaky when you when you think of uh, uh, conservatives, liberal conservatives, people who are more traditional. And you know, when I say that, you know, I, I, I just just for the record, I, I'm not myself. I don't consider myself fully as a conservative. I'm a liberal conservative. But but this is this is a real this is a reality, right? That 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 you know, the creative class has moved the cursor at least when it comes to the establishment, what we would call the mainstream media, more more to the left, at least on cultural matters. So. Uh, you know, how do we change it? Well, there are there are two ways in which things can be changed. Uh, the first one is uh, by making a better effort at looking at where the money is uh, and where the money is available. Because you know, we talk about Jeff Bezos, we talk about uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and although Zuckerberg wants to really maintain neutrality, but when we talk about you know all these new creative people that are uh, that that come on the market and that that are mostly uh, or that we see as supportive of the left. Let's remember that for you know every uh, Jeff Bezos, there is a a a, a Koch brothers. The, the Koch brothers are still there, right? That uh, uh, you know, and and they put a lot of money into conservative uh, into conservative causes. Now, the thing is that those conservative causes might not always be the same. I mean, for example, the I I I, I might be wrong, but I, I think the Koch brothers no longer. Uh, uh, give money to causes that um, uh, that that go against uh, uh, or, or that that are basically critical about the uh, LGBT community because they have uh, they have moved on that subject like much of American uh, uh, public opinion and I would say actually Donald Trump helped the Republican Party move on that on, on that front. I'm not making a judgment here on this. I'm just I'm just telling you how how things have moved in America. So you know there is you know. There's the question: Where is the money, and what, you know, what makes the 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 the, the funders tick? 
And, and these things are changing. I mean, if you look at conservative causes, you know, before it would have been on a, a number of cultural issues, uh, and it would have, and, and it would have been on economic issues, on you know, making sure that the private sector remains uh, 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 remains free in uh, uh, in America. I'm talking about America here. Uh, today, you know, uh, fundraising in conservative circles is much different. You have the, you still have the sort of you know, uh, economic liberal. Uh, 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 circles in Wall Street and, and and around Wall Street, but but you have uh, you have different different circles. You have the you know the traditional uh, uh, evangelist, Catholic, conservative Catholic circles, but you also have a whole new bunch of pe uh, of, of people who are more in the you know you would call them the Trump circles, and they see that the future of the cons of the conservative movement, the future of the of the Republican parties with the working class and and with a, a sort of nationalist. Uh, uh, you know, nationalist appeal, and and that that nationalist appeal is different from individual to, to individual. You have uh, people who talk about a very civic nationalism. Uh, uh, that's the people, for example, who are around Nikki Haley, uh, and you have people who are much more uh, uh, who are for a much more uh, uh, um, I, I would say uh, testosterone nationalism, and that's the people who are. Uh, I would say are around uh, Steve Bannon, who is much more radical. So you know, mapping out where the where the money is, because the money. I mean, conservatives have money by by definition. Conservatism is a state of it's 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 not an ideology; it's a state of mind, right? You want to keep things uh, uh, as they are, and usually the people who are well into the systems are well into the system are people who want. Uh, uh, to to have things stay the same, so there is money. It's just the conservatism is is changing, and uh, uh, and people have to uh, have to move with it. Uh, uh, by the way, you now have people in the um, uh, in the the leadership of Facebook uh, who have become uh, our major donors for the Republican Party under Donald Trump. Uh, so you know to to just give up on the on 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 some segments of the creative class because they are creative class. Uh, it is not necessarily the right way for conservatives to move forward. It's only you know it it is it, it is a difficult time for conservatives because it is a conf these are confusing times in which things are changing. And I think the, the 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 question is also including in the fundraising when you when you move on and talk to, to funders is the question you know what do you want being a conservative is you want to keep what is important. And the question is you know what are the important things that conservatives want to keep and i i think that answer is not always clear uh, uh from the point of view of conservatives also because there are different trends of conservatism that want to keep different things well uh, you you you've done a lot of uh example from from the united states um, but um i think that surely in the united states we have a, a generally a more ideological and more value or oriented public that, uh, that than in Europe. In Europe, uh, on the left side, probably uh, there is still a, an ideological oriented uh, civil society, whereas in the right, I feel more that this uh, uh, ideological mobilization, this value oriented mm -hmm. uh, politics is not so 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 strong at least in 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 this phase of of our history maybe also that is partly uh, an an explanation of for that difficult to 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 obtain uh, uh, donation to to fundraise from the conservative point of uh, of view yeah well yes in the sense that you know the, the 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 left has managed to organize and to make you know to 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 make a whole network of civil society that serves its purposes and because people on the right are more attached to the individual and to individual values they've been late in organizing themselves that being said they also organize, they have historically organized, you know, the Catholic Church is a very good example of that. The Catholic Church is part of civil society. Um, and uh, uh, and the Protestant churches in America are, an, are, are another example. I think it's, a, it, it's also a question of better organizing. Also, you know, and again, you know, really thinking through how do we organize, how do we better organize to get our point of view to be not only to be around, but also to be respected uh, without, compromi com without compromising on those values. Uh, and um, I, I mean, generally, 
putting oneself in the mood that, you know, if, if there are some values that we want to defend, then we need to organize uh, into a, you know, a civil society ourselves. And, and that civil society, I'm, I'm not saying that you need to build a, uh, you know, a, a rival network of, of civil society, or I mean, you need to build civil society as the, the American rights built a, a, a rival civil society, but that, that civil society needs to be exchanging with the with the with the other uh, other groups in uh, uh, you know in order to 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 get their uh, uh, to 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 get their way i mean you, sometimes you find yourself in america or in germany or in france uh, with uh, uh, weird coalitions of different people uh, who have very different points of view on economics and who come together on social issues and vice versa so um, i i think the, the effort needs to be made on organizing uh, the effort needs to be made on defining, uh, uh, you know, uh, defining common interests and defining, you know, uh, uh, particular interests. And it, it comes with time. A lot of things come with time. You need to take a lot of efforts. It takes a lot of efforts of trial and failure uh, to get to a civil society that is vibrant and that is uh, uh, that that allows for a more balanced debate. But but I think it's I think it's doable. Uh, I mean, again, it was done in America. In America, you had, you know, lawyers were mostly on the left in the, you know, judges were mostly on the left in, uh, uh, in the 1970s. And, uh, you know, there was the Federalist Society that was uh, uh, put, put up by, that was made up by a bunch of judges who said, you know, we don't want to leave, uh, you know, something as important as the courts as the sole prerogative of, of the left. And therefore we're going to organize. And, you know, the, 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 the debate is still there. And it's, you know, there's a, uh, uh, there's a slight advantage to the conservatives in the, in the Supreme Court. There's a, there's an overall advantage to conservatives in the courts, which I think is not a health, it's not an unhealthy thing because generally courts are, are here to have held to uphold the law and not to be creative with their interpretation of the law. But that was done by a long-term effort by, you know, uh, uh, organizations like the, the Federalist Society who, you know, really did the, the hard work of organizing and of, you know, getting to, uh, you know, finding where the money was, going into uh, um, in, into low schools to recruit new members, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, here in, in Europe, we are much less, you know, we're, we're less oriented towards civil society, right? So it's it's an extra effort that we that, that we need to do. But I think it's it's completely doable and, and it might not be at the same scale as in America, but, but you know, the fact that, you know, there are, there are think, tank like, think tanks like yours uh, is, uh, you know, is proof that, you know, it, it, it is possible. And, uh, you know, uh, having you guys uh, expand your, your activities is, uh, is something that I think is good for the, uh, for the political debate, whether, whether one agrees with your ideas or not. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, well, you know, so well and in depth the United States, because uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, you have uh, a role uh, at the International Republican Institute. Um, could you present that that institution that is maybe not too well known by the Italian public? Sure. So the International Republican Institute is is one of many organizations that were uh, uh, created following the uh, the the, the nineteen eighty three uh, speech of Ronald Reagan, the Westminster speech. Uh, in which basically he contended that uh, democracy was not the prerogative of a few, but it was a universal right for everybody. And um, IRI, along with our colleagues from NDI, which is our, our pension in the pendant in the Democratic uh, Party, uh, and a, a, a whole bunch of all other organizations such, such as the Solidarity Center, uh, National Endowment for Democracy, um, we've we've all. Or we've organized ourselves, we've all uh, uh, worked out for the past 35 years uh, to, to try and advance and protect democracy worldwide in all of its different manifestations. And on our part, we're more on the political party side because, you know, just like NDI, uh, we focus on political parties because although we are not, we don't have institutional links 
with the Republican Party, we are um, uh, all of our mem all of the members of our board are uh, uh, prominent members of the Republican Party, senators, members of the House of Representatives, former uh, uh, politicians. Uh, the uh, former chairman of our board was the late John McCain, uh, whom I think uh, many of you know. Um, and um, uh, and so that means that you know there is an R in IRI. Uh, it's not the I think it's not probably it might not be the as important as a lot of people would think. We're not the you know uh, the the international arm of the of the Republican Party, but it's definitely part of our identity, and uh, uh, we try to 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 work with uh, like minded. Uh, uh, people and parties who um, who believe in democracy, who think that it is the best uh, uh, the best way to organize a society, uh, to pick up the glove because I think now we uh, we are uh, at least right now we are uh, really under the challenge of the the Chinese Communist Party who who tries to uh, uh, convince uh, politicians and people around the world that they have a a model that is working better than than, than ours, and I think it is worth for us. Uh, uh, preserving our our way of life and our our democracy, um, and uh, you know we, we we want to build that dialogue uh, uh, around the world with the, uh, the democratic forces, mostly on the center right, because you know again there is an R in our in in, in our uh, in our name, and 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 personally I'm I'm very proud of that R. Uh, so uh, you know we, we're really here. Uh, our raison d'être is is really to. Uh, uh, share best practices to think together with like-minded organizations, like-minded parties about how we can strengthen our institutions, strengthen democracy, uh, and uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the present situation, come out of this crisis that originated in a, apparently in a lab in Wuhan um, uh, to 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 get our Western societies and our democratic institutions stronger out of this crisis. So we are at the end of our talk. Thank you a lot, Thibault, for these uh, really interesting remarks and uh, uh, important reflections. I remind again that I recommend your book, The Great Class Shift, Our New Social Class Structures Are Redefining Western Politics. So thanks, everyone, for watching, and see you at the, uh, our next Machiavelli's Live. <laughs>